Welcome to our channel. I'm telling you life stories. Listen carefully and don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so as not to miss new videos. Then we started. I am Laura, 29 years old, and my husband is Richard, 30 years old. We made the decision to live with his parents because Richard often expressed his desire to give back to his parents someday, considering himself the eldest son. Richard's parents are incredibly kind and uphold strong values that I deeply respect. I believe that if we have children in the future, it would be beneficial for them to grow up around their grandparents, learning about society through their experiences. Therefore, I was in favor of the idea of living together. However, there was a catch in this seemingly perfect in-law setup. Richard's unmarried sister, Nalissa, 26 years old, also lived at home. My first encounter with her was when I went to announce our engagement, and she remarked sarcastically, So, you're the latest addition to the family, huh? My initial impression of my sister-in-law was unfavorable. She seemed to disapprove of her parents' approval of me and displayed a bad attitude. A few weeks after moving in, during a meal, I was serving food to everyone at their respective places. Melissa suddenly exclaimed in disapproval, Wow! What? You placed the food at your seat first. I was taken aback by her unexpected outburst. I explained that my seat was closest to the kitchen, but she continued to make a fuss, insisting that I should have served her first. Witnessing this, my husband stepped in, reminding her of the importance of respecting me as the wife of the eldest son. However, Melissa retorted, dismissing me as just another woman from outside the family refusing to acknowledge the significance of our relationship within the family hierarchy. Melissa's remark about me not being particularly attractive and deserving to be treated accordingly elicited a furious response from Richard. Sensing the brewing tension between siblings, I intervened, reassuring Richard and diffusing the situation. Richard, it's okay, thank you. I said before turning to Melissa, I'm sorry. Next time, I'll serve your portion first. I had my reasons for diffusing the conflict. Family arguments were counterproductive, especially considering our shared living situation and the fact that Richard had informed me that Melissa was likely getting married soon, which could potentially change our dynamic. However, Melissa's condescending attitude persisted. She would demand things from me with an air of entitlement criticizing me for not anticipating her preferences. Her demeaning behavior escalated, treating me like a maid. I noticed that she behaved differently when her parents were around, which made me hesitant to discuss the issue with them. One night after midnight, she arrived home completely drunk, waking me up with her complaints. Worried about her safety, I helped her to the living room where she began to share details about her life. She boasted about her fiance, emphasizing how different their situation was from mine. According to her, they could afford to order food from any restaurant every day, unlike us, who, in her words, were stuck with bland mushroom soup for the P.O. Despite her condescending tone, I chose to remain patient and composed, realizing that her behavior was a reflection of her own insecurities and need for validation. The difference between us became starkly apparent, I'm not like you, plain-faced maid. My sister-in-law sneered, demanding water in the middle of the night. I muttered my annoyance under my breath, but she, emboldened by a few drinks, fixed me with a sharp glare. What's with that look? Are you defying me because you're just a maid, living off my parents? It's only fitting to call you that, she scoffed, repeating the word maid with drunken laughter. Despite my urge to retaliate, I restrained myself. I was determined to uphold social manners, especially for the sake of my unborn baby. My husband and I chose to live with his parents to support them. They were good people, and I wanted to help. Yet being looked down upon as a mere maid was infuriating. Trying to distract myself, I began cleaning, but the frustration lingered, my grip on the vacuum tightening. During my cleaning spree, I noticed wedding invitations on the table, suggesting my sister-in-law was getting married. 
Curiosity peaked. I examined the name on the invitation and realized I knew the guy. An idea struck me. Maybe I could put her arrogant attitude in its place. The day she brought her boyfriend home, I had just finished cleaning the balcony and garage. As I returned inside, she berated me for taking too long, oblivious to the fact that I was just 10 minutes past our agreed meeting time. I echoed her words, emphasizing maid. How many times do I have to tell you? You're basically the maid, she ranted. I smiled inwardly, confident that I could finally show her that being respectful to others, regardless of their status, was the true mark of class. I wouldn't have renewed your contract, I retorted, my words cutting through the air like a knife. Her face flushed with anger, her voice rising in volume. I calculated the perfect moment to strike. Anyone in the living room would surely hear her now. Maintaining an air of innocence, I went to serve the tea. And there he was, Michael. I called out to him just as Isis, my sister's fiancé, did. I had suspected our connection, and my hunch was right. He was her first love. Hot Laura? Michael looked up in surprise. You haven't changed at all, still as funny as ever, I said smiling at him. My sister-in-law stared at us, stunned, her head swiveling between the two of us as she tried to comprehend our acquaintance. Michael continued, More than acquaintances, she was my first love. My sister-in-law's face turned pale, and she almost collapsed into her chair. No way, you were engaged too. This woman, you were just a second-hand product. The word second-hand didn't escape my ears. People who belittle others often reveal their true colors. I seized the opportunity, repeating the word for emphasis. He mentioned maid in the kitchen earlier. My sister-in-law stammered, her escape route blocked. Oh, that was just a joke between us. You know how we joke around. She tried to dismiss it, but I wasn't letting her off the hook. Complaining about the table service order and calling me plain Jane, are those jokes too? Because if they are, they're in bad taste, I challenged, refusing to back down. Michael chimed in, objecting to being called secondhand like a thrift store item. The irony of her insults finally struck her, and her discomfort was evident. This was my chance to strike back at the sister-in-law who had made my life miserable. It felt like a miraculous opportunity, a gift from the heavens. Slowly, I approached her, applying gentle pressure. Shall we share some memories of being called secondhand and maid? I said, my tone drippy with irony. As I placed the tea on the table, Michael settled back into the couch, saying, Thank you, Laura, signaling that the tables had turned in my favor. I first met Lori back in high school when I was part of the basketball team, and she was the captain of the girls' basketball team. During my slumps, she always encouraged me, emphasizing that recognizing the issue was the first step toward improvement. She had a way of offering positive words, even appreciating small details like the trajectory of my shots. Lori's wisdom stuck with me, especially her advice that life wasn't a tournament with definitive defeats, but rather a league where wins and losses alternated. Her occasional gesture of giving me sports drinks meant the world to me. I must admit, I harbored a small crush on her and even asked her out, but Laura was incredibly popular. His expression remained stoic as he continued. After I asked her out one summer and got rejected, Lori remained considerate. She still treated me the same and even continued giving me drinks. My first love was a mix of bitterness and sweetness. He looked directly at my sister-in-law, accusing Laura of being called maid and me secondhand. Suddenly, I saw my opportunity. I now understand the kind of person you are, he said, his voice firm. I can't see us continuing this relationship. My sister-in-law turned ghostly pale and began sobbing, revealing her desperate circumstances. I'm in a tight spot now. I even quit my job. He looked puzzled but remained stern. You quit? He asked. Before she could respond, I jumped in. I didn't ask her to quit, he said. This unexpected revelation provided my chance. 
Didn't she talk about how you wanted to be together forever? How? With your earnings, she could live a lavish lifestyle, ordering takeout every day. I exposed her deception. My sister-in-law's eyes widened in shock. You didn't have to say all that to Michael, she stammered, attempting to justify herself. I chuckled, confident in my revelation. Of course, I had to say it. After all, I know Michael. It's like watching everything unfold in a reality TV show, except I heard everything in person. Michael buried his face in his hands, clearly overwhelmed by the situation. I never told you to quit your job. I mean, I didn't say to continue either, he responded, leaving her to confront her own choices and deceptions. Michael shrugged, voicing his concerns. Did you decide to marry me because of my university and my job? Normally, you wouldn't think of marrying someone who calls you secondhand. It became apparent that Michael was leaning towards breaking off the engagement. My sister-in-law, desperate to avoid that outcome, started making feeble excuses that didn't hold water. Calling you secondhand can't be helped. It's a stain on your past, sure. But while we can't erase the past, we can create a future, he retorted sharply. I intervened, trying to reason with her. I told you I don't see it as a stain. In fact, I see it as a good memory, he added, his frustration mounting. But my sister-in-law's agitation seemed to cloud her judgment, and she began to blurt out nonsensical words. How are you going to take responsibility for me quitting my job? Are you going to pay me damages and support me with that money? If that's the case, we might as well get married. Come on, marry me right now. Right this instant, she yelled, grabbing Michael by the collar. Michael started to speak, his voice trembling. I never asked you to quit. Just then, a trembling voice interrupted, and we turned to see my mother-in-law standing there. I heard voices from downstairs, so I thought Michael was here. When I came down, I saw the two of you arguing loudly. I was waiting for a moment to step in, but what I heard was so unbelievable that I just froze, she said, her expression grim. Behind her, my father-in-law stood imposingly, and even further back, my husband trembled. I really am sorry for what happened, Michael, my father-in-law said. My apologies to Michael too, but the one who's really been wronged is Laura. My mother-in-law added, her eyes welling up. Why did you curl such harsh words like maid at Laura, who's always been so kind to us? She did everything out of goodwill, and you belittled her. Apologize now. My husband's voice was hoarse as he spoke. Laura didn't want you to hear bad things about your own daughter. She endured it all on her own. I knew about it, but I'm sorry, Laura. I hadn't realized you were being referred to as a maid recently. Apologize now, my mother-in-law said firmly, slapping my sister-in-law across the face. Grinning her teeth and glaring at me, my sister-in-law managed to choke out. I, I'm sorry. However, Michael intervened coldly. You don't have to apologize to me. I want you to apologize to Laura and ensure you never treat her this way again. I don't want to see my first love cry, but I don't need your apology. I feel bad for your parents, but this was a good opportunity to see the kind of person you are before marriage. Let's forget this ever happened. He turned to my tearful sister-in-law and added, if you have an issue with being secondhand, then you should have stayed away from me. I never asked you to quit your job, as he prepared to leave, he apologized once more to my mother-in-law and father-in-law. At least make it seem like I dumped you, he urged. My sister-in-law screamed. Enough is enough. But my father-in-law also slapped her across the face. Michael, thank you for coming today. I hope you'll find a wonderful person next time, my father-in-law said gently, patting Michael's shoulder. After that, my sister-in-law was forcibly kicked out of the house. Laura, I'm so sorry for everything, my mother-in-law said, apologizing even though she hadn't done anything wrong. We truly appreciate everything you've done for us. I married into this family because I really like you and father. I want to be with you always, forever, 
I said, holding Lionel's hand. My in-laws disowned my sister-in-law, vowing never to let her near me again. Months later, my sister-in-law sent an email to my husband, asking for financial help, claiming she couldn't find a job and couldn't pay her rent. However, my husband blocked her in front of me. Several years later, I heard that Michael got married. We started to keep in touch again after the incident with my sister-in-law. By then, I had given birth to our first child. When we have our own kids, I'd like parenting advice from you, Michael said. Yay, our child is so lucky to have grandparents who adore her, I replied. We want our child to be loved and to know love. We named our child Amy, which means beloved.